Meet Hank. He's a North American Angus bull. Like most Angus, he grows fast, makes a tasty steak, and can't grow horns so he can't hurt himself or his herd. This is Pablo. He's a South American Nalori bull. He's strong, can survive in harsh climates, and isn't susceptible to insects and parasites. So why are these bulls so different? It's because of selective breeding. Civilization grew around the domestication of livestock. It changed the way that human populations existed. The first time humans tried their hand at selective breeding was to domesticate a furry best friend, the dog. Livestock came next, followed by horses, then camelids. As for cats, studies show they may have domesticated themselves. By doing that, we were creating animals by way of human intervention to have traits and characteristics that control growth, traits that control hardiness, traits that control production of products, whether it's meat, milk, or fiber for human consumption. And so we tried to improve traits by changing the genetic makeup of the population. Modern livestock are the result of thousands of years of selective breeding. But as modern civilization continues to grow, it's more important than ever. Food security is probably one of the biggest threats to the persistence of human civilization um, as the human population continues to expand and we reach points where the resources we have available can't provide food security at a level that we have now, um, just maintaining status quo. And today's status quo isn't nearly enough. Currently, about one billion people worldwide are considered malnourished. This is a huge problem. About nine million people die every year from starvation. That's more than cancer, malaria, foodborne illness, and HIV AIDS combined. Meanwhile, as the population nears 10 billion people, food production needs to increase by 60% just to keep up. Dr. Oatley believes a modern approach to selective breeding can be a part of the solution. The efficiency by which animals create those products for human consumption is influenced by genetics. And so by selective breeding, we're trying to create a unique combination of genetics within an animal that will enhance the efficiency by which it can create products that humans will consume. Let's go back to Pablo. His breed's ability to thrive in harsh climates makes Nalori the cattle of choice in South America, where 80% of the world's exported beef is produced. However, Pablo's offspring can't match the level and quality of meat production from Hank's offspring. The solution is to combine their best traits by breeding a Nalori with an Angus, creating a hardy, bug-resistant bull that grows fast and produces quality beef. Sounds simple, right? Unfortunately, it's not as easy as it might seem. Hank isn't well suited to tropical climates and wouldn't last long in the Nalori's natural habitat. On the other hand, artificial insemination is expensive and impractical in many parts of the world where herds range freely. Surrogate sires is essentially a technology to capitalize on unique genetics as a way to get both large-scale and worldwide dissemination of what would be deemed desirable genetics. The key to this method is that the recipient males have to be sterile. Using CRISPR-Cas9, the genes of those males are altered before birth to ensure that they can't make their own sperm. Before they reach adulthood, we introduce Hank's sperm-producing stem cells, allowing the sterile Nalori bulls to produce sperm with Hank's genetic traits. Once they reach sexual maturity, the recipient Nalori bulls can be released into a herd to breed naturally and sire offspring that carry the best traits of both Nalori and Angus cattle. The beauty of surrogate sires is it can be applied to any animal population. It's not just cattle and pigs. We talk about cattle and pigs because they're huge populations of animals. But both goats and sheep, surrogate sires is also, also applicable and we are working in that domain as well. And the idea is to then introduce that breeding technology of surrogate sires into those regions of the world where sheep and goats are the major food commodity. So far, surrogate sire technology has bred healthy piglets, bucks, and a set of calves were born in fall 2019 at WSU. The results are promising, but this technology needs governmental and public support in order to succeed. An investment to get the concepts and the research and development that we're doing now at places like Washington State University, it would be on the order of millions of dollars to make this happen, but it's needed.
We have to do this if we want to have civilization persist as it is and also address food security. We need to do these things. We as a population have to decide that this is something we're going to do because eventually it's going to get to a point where even those of us that exist and live in high income countries and don't see problems with food security, we're going to start to see it. While the issue of food security is complex and very real, WSU, with the help of researchers like Dr. Oatley and the College of Veterinary Medicine, is working hard to help find possible solutions. Surrogate Sires is a technology that shows promise and could someday help make a difference, feeding people at home and around the world.